Well, today I'm going to be talking on the topic of deploy, but before I do, I need to do a quick costume change, okay? Just give me a second. <clears throat> Good morning, soldiers. Welcome to your first day of deployment. My name is James Charles, Captain, General, Sergeant, Lieutenant, Admiral. Welcome to base. The king asked me to tell you how grateful he is that you would enlist on this, the highest of callings, serving in his forces. I hope you came ready to learn today because I'm going to be sharing with you the secrets of making a successful transition from civilian life to life as a soldier. I want to first introduce you to your barracks. Your barracks are the place you will live. These are not permanent dwellings, but so long as you are here, you shall call them home. Some of you will be living in the inner city barracks, others of you downtown. Some of you in the burbs, a few of you near the coast, a few in the hills. Some of you will be in the dorms, and others of you will be living in military housing. Regardless of the size and location of your barrack, it is the property of the kings, so steward it with the greatest of care. <laughs> Wherever your barrack is, see to it that you tend to your home with the greatest of care. This is where it all starts. Spend each time in the morning conversing with the king. Receive your marching orders and you will know just what to do each day. See to it that you love and respect your comrades and your kin, for it is they who will have your back on the day of battle. For you soldiers with little soldiers at home, be sure to instruct them in the ways of service to the king. Seize every opportunity for training and discipling so that they too will learn the ways of war. See also to exemplify Christ and represent the king while at home, for there will be civilians living among you. If you come across any casualties of war, people wounded by the enemy, see to it that you minister to them immediately. Leverage every opportunity to cultivate kingdom community, kingdom family, to build the body and to reach the lost and to contribute to the prosperity of the community in which you live. Second, let me introduce you to the base. This is our base. It is here at base that we will gather weekly for the purposes of training and equipping. It is here that we will regroup, celebrate our victories, mourn our losses, bury our dead, and do what we are doing today, initiating new soldiers into service of the king. Our worship will recenter us on who it is that we fight for and prepare us to plunder the pits of hell once we leave. See to it that you do not rob one another of the opportunity to share in your fellowship. Come as you are, not as you think you ought to be. Soldiers, if you ain't able to get real, how can I trust you on the day of battle to get my back? Commit to learning and growing here. Refine your skills. Discipline your weaknesses and pursue excellence. When you are out of ammunition, come and replenish. Listen to the word. Meditate on the word. Memorize the word. Be strengthened by the word. This is your sword. If your fatigues are torn and tattered from the days of battle, let them be mended here at the base. On base, each must have a role to play. This is your base. Treat it as so. This is not a concert venue. It is not a movie theater. 
It is not a place for spectators and tourists. So roll up your sleeves and serve. As part of your life on base, you will have the opportunity to be mentored by seasoned soldiers. And you too will be expected to invest in other soldiers, teaching them what it is to love and to serve and lead them into all maturity. On base, you will participate in small group cohorts. This will be your cell, your squad, your platoon. In these groups, encourage one another. Bear one another's burdens and give to all who are in need. Finally, I need to introduce you to the battlefield. This is our battlefield. Some of you will be deployed on mission overseas for church planning. But most will be deployed right here to the marketplaces and various spheres of society. This is your mission field. This here is your battlefield. As soldiers, you are about to experience the incredible work that Christ himself predestined long ago. And when I say work, I mean work. Some days will be long and arduous. Some days are boring and routine. Ask any soldier. They know the ebbs and flow of warfare. Hurry up and wait, as they say. But I say pray, seek, and wait upon the Lord. Your work is holy. Let your work each day be an act of worship. Take heart from greats who have gone before you. Luke, the great physician. Paul, the tent maker. Lydia, the clothing maker. And Joseph, the carpenter. While serving here, be careful not to get carried away by the concerns of civilian life and pleasures. As enticing as they are, they have the power to cause grown men to lose rank or worse, to receive dishonorable discharge. The battlefield is the place where you will advance the kingdom in every sphere of society. The battlefield is the place where you will tear down enemy strongholds, those things that are not right in your world. And then you will erect kingdom outposts and standards that will serve people and bring them into a saving relationship with Jesus. The battlefield is the place where you will serve others as Christ himself served us. The battlefield is where you will indeed heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. Sometimes you will do this supernaturally. Other times you will do this naturally using your God-given talents and training that you already possess. Both are holy. The battlefield is the place where you will proclaim good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind. It is here that you will set the oppressed free. Your mission will require you to take on a variety of roles. Sometimes you'll be leading out in front, but often behind the scenes. Sometimes you'll be working behind a desk, and sometimes in the dirt. Sometimes you will be honored, but seek no honor for yourself. You will indeed become all things to all people, so that by all possible means you might save some. Remember this. If you spend time with the king each day, you will receive your marching orders and you will know just what to do. The battlefield is the place where you will lay down your life for the sake of others. The world, ladies and gentlemen, no longer serves you. You exist to serve the world. Treat no one as beneath you. 
and be ready to engage with anyone, at any time, anywhere. The battlefield is the place where you will experience the mighty power of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit at work through you. The battlefield is the place where you will be seeking and saving the lost, the orphans, the fatherless, the prisoners of war, and bringing them back into the arms of the Father. Remember that your work is not for yourself. You do not work for the man, but you work for the king, for Christ and his kingdom. Finally, soldiers, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the enemy. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. Well, I know that we have many actual soldiers in our midst. I'm so appreciative of the military. Thank you for all of you that serve, have served, or plan on serving our great country. This uh, creative monologue, as you might imagine, is a way for us to remember that we, too, are enlisted in a service, in a military service of God. Well, about 15 years ago, I received an opportunity to come on staff full-time at a church in ministry. And for me, this was a dream. I had arrived. I was full-time, salaried. I had an office. I had administrative support. I had an assistant. This was my moment. You see, years before that, I had felt a strong call into the ministry I got rocked by God, just set on fire, and I thought I'm going to serve God with all of my life, which I just thought, of course, that means I'm going to be a pastor, right? So for a few years in between, I worked in the landscape industry, I worked as a courier, I worked painting houses, and all of those things, for me, were just a means to an end, just biding time until I would eventually get to finally do the real work of God. And so I did work as a youth pastor for three years, and I loved it. I loved what I got to do. I loved working with students. I loved teaching, and I loved counseling, I loved writing curriculum. But then I met a girl named Katie. Katie got a job out of state. And so this youth pastor had to hang it up. So I resigned from that position, and we moved ourselves out of state to Wheaton, Illinois, and I found myself in need of a job. So I thought, well, surely this professional Christian could have got a job anywhere. So I applied to churches, private schools, campus ministry positions, but nothing opened up for me. And so I was desperate. And so I started applying to just anything that I could find. So I applied to a Starbucks, and then I applied to a front desk position at a tennis and health club in Wheaton, Illinois. And an opportunity opened up for $14 an hour, working a front desk position for 20 hours a week. So I said to myself, hey, at least we'll get a great membership to a health club, right? 
Well, it didn't take very long before I was feeling extremely unfulfilled, very dissatisfied, and extremely miserable. I would come home at the end of my days complaining, grumbling. I was, I was low energy. I'd go to bed early. I'd sleep in if I could. I'd go back to work. And day after day, I felt the mundane nature of my job. I'd pick up the phone day after day, making phone call after phone call, punching the time clock, spreadsheets, giving people tours of the health club, and going through the script again on selling them on a health club membership. And after a year, my wife was so fed up with my attitude that she finally one day just said, honey, do you think you need to quit your job? She said, I could get a part-time job in addition to my full-time job in my grad school program. And, and <laughs> talk about convicting and embarrassing. Like, what kind of husband can't hold a job and his wife has to hold a job and a half in grad school? So I was convicted. Thankfully, uh, my wife and I had entered into our church's training school program that fall, and we had started reading through the Bible in a year. And I'd come across Jeremiah 28 and 29. For those of you that don't know the context of this, there's this false prophet that comes to the people of Israel, and he says, his name's Hananiah, he says, two years from now, God's going to deliver you from this place, and you're going to get out of here. And they all rejoiced. But Jeremiah came to him and said, you are a false prophet. Seventy years from now, God is going to release you from this place. And at first, when I read about Hananiah, I was like, oh, surely this is the word of the Lord. Two years and I'm out of here. Okay. <laughs> Two months time. So what I did is I started like dusting off my resume. I started using company time to start searching on LinkedIn and Indeed and trying to find another job. But when I came across these words from Jeremiah 29, it read this, plan to stay. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I realized in that season that sometimes God sends us to places, but then once we get there, he actually invites us to stay. So God said, hey, James, put away that resume. You're not going anywhere anytime soon. And so I committed and I resolved to the Lord to be wholehearted and fully present where I was in that job in that season. And I discovered something incredible. I did not need a title to be a professional Christian. I did not need a title to become a minister of the gospel. Over the course of the next few years, things started happening for me that I had never experienced before. In fact, I found myself doing more ministry in that place at the Wheaton Sports Center than I had ever done as a full-time youth pastor. I mean, I was sharing the gospel with people like strangers. You know what I mean? Like, it's one thing when you're a pastor and people expect you to do that on a stage. It's another thing to like strike up a conversation and offer to pray for them or to share the gospel. So I was doing this. I was praying for my coworkers and I actually had the opportunity to lead a coworker to Christ and I had my first disciple there in the marketplace. On my lunch breaks, I would walk the quarter mile indoor track at the Wheaton Sports Center and I'd start praying for this establishment. I'd pray for the business owners and my managers and my coworkers and the patrons. And I started realizing that there was a lot of things that were kingdom in a sports center. Health is a good thing. I started experiencing community. There was life in this place. What a strategic place to build community, to build the kingdom. Day after day, you see the same people over and over. And so I did. And it would actually be seven years from the time I was a full-time youth pastor to the time I came back on staff here at All People's Church. And during that time, I learned so many invaluable skills. And the only reason that I decided to come back into church full-time vocationally is because God's words is in Ephesians that he has given us people like apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists to equip who? The saints, which is who? You for the work of ministry. And so it's my passion, it's my hope, as it is with all of us on staff here, 
to equip you for the real work of ministry in the real battlefield, which is the places that you are day in and day out. I love what Heidi Baker said. She put it this way. She said, you have no authority where you have no love. But in the places where you have love, you have great authority. My discipler at the time at the Wheaton Sports Center said, James, I don't know if there's anybody, if you think about it, that prays for the Wheaton Sports Center as much as you do. And so he said, God's going to give you favor in that place. And there was earthly favor. It was interesting. I got a promotion. My sales numbers increased. We had the breakthrough records of consecutive months of meeting our sales goals, which is great. But there was so much favor with people there. You have no authority where you have no love. Do you have love for the place where God has sent you? This quote I found this past week is also very convicting. And I think it applies to people, not just myself, but people that aren't in full-time vocational ministry. Pastor T.J. Green says this, if you need a crowd, a platform, a title, or a mic in order to minister, you might only be a performer, not a prophet. You might only be a professional, not a pastor. But if you stop for the one, welcome to the ministry. Isn't that good? Before we close the message today, I want to offer some practical tools for you as you begin your deployment. The title of my message is The Barracks, the Base, and the Battlefield. And so starting with the barracks, I want us to think about our home life because it's here that our days start and the rest of our world stems from. William McRaven, U.S. Navy Admiral, during a commencement speech at a university in Texas once said, if you want to change the world, start every day by making your bed. I like this because it speaks to the simplicity of beginnings matter. How you start your day matters. What you do at your home matters. So I want you to think about your rhythms and your routines. Think about your sleep and your Sabbath. Are they setting you up for mission? Think about what you eat and drink. Is it bringing you life and health and vitality for your mission? Think about your physical exercise. Are you training as a soldier for battle? Do you have in your home a culture of grace, of love, and healthy conflict? Do you have financial health in your home? Your home life matters because it sets you up for success every day. And so if you need help in any of these areas, here's my practical application for you. I want you to make a point to come this summer to our summer night series. On Wednesday nights, we're going to start diving into some of these topics of things like relationships and finances. That's why we do this as a church is to train and equip you, not just for a healthy home life, but so that you can be effective for the long haul and bear fruit that lasts. Let's think about our base here, the church. You have to ask yourself, are you a spectator or are you an active participant here at All People's Church? Like I said, this is your base. Are you contributing to this base? One of the ways we do that basically is financially through tithing, Another way we do this is through serving as volunteers. I happen to know somebody that's very passionate about about volunteering. So if you want to talk to me, I'd love to get you connected. Are you growing? Are you growing in discipleship and life group? That's all part of our base life here. If you aren't all in yet at this point, stop by our Connect Center afterwards, right out here. And we want to help you get connected. We have numerous ways for you to use your gifts and your talents to contribute here to your base. Lastly, the battlefield. 
If you're taking notes, I'm going to give you just a few things to ask yourself about the sphere of influence that God has placed you in. A sphere is a place where God reveals a certain attribute of his character to the world. A sphere is all about bringing his great character and his nature into everyday life. Some examples of domains and spheres are education, business and economics, family, technology, healthcare, arts and entertainment, hospitality, food and dining, government and law, science, religion, media, agriculture, and sports. And if you think of each one of those spheres, there's a certain attribute of God's nature and character that is being presented to the world. For example, our God is a healer. Is that not demonstrated in the healthcare industry? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Is that not demonstrated in the food and dining industry? How about the hospitality industry? Does God not provide shelter for us, care for us, comfort us? So too, we have an opportunity to do that. So ask yourself this question, what is God's heart for my sphere of influence? What are some Bible verses that speak to this sphere of influence that God has sent me into? And then you can ask yourself more specifically about your company, your organization, what currently is kingdom about the place that I work and serve? What things that are happening right now are kingdom, are healthy, are good, are glorifying, are edifying? And then ask yourself, what is not kingdom about the place currently where I live? And just from those three questions, you've got your prayer life set. You've got your prayers set. But then finally, you're going to need to ask God, how are you uniquely positioned to take new ground for the kingdom? What relationships or roles has God given you? What unique responsibilities do you have that might open the door for Jesus? You know, as a pastor, I'm I'm limited in so many ways to who comes here on the weekends. Of course, I go shopping, but... You have access to people that I will never be able to influence. You have unique positions that will open up the door for the kingdom to so many. Just like Esther, God has raised you up for such a time as this. We need you in every sphere of society. It gets me fired up to see these pictures of our church at work in such a variety of spheres. We need more. We need more people in every sphere of society. So if this is an area, the battlefield that you're wanting to grow in, if you want to feel more equipped, more trained, more clear on how God has has called you and wired you, here's my practical application. I want you to apply for the School of Transformation. I know. I'm taking liberty today to plug people into my ministries. We spend a lot of time in the School of Transformation talking through these questions and discussing them amongst ourselves and praying into them and getting vision from God for our life, our day-to-day life, taking the mundane and turning it into something supernatural and seeing God at work all over our city. It's my passion. It's my heart. And like I said, many of you will be called into the nations, but as long as you're here, let's make the use the best of it, right? Right? Let's seize every opportunity, becoming all things to all people, so that by all possible means, we might win some. Well, today is a day of commissioning, and so I'm going to invite, in just a moment, uh, any of you who feel that your calling is here, to San Diego. If at this point, you feel that you haven't been called overseas, at this point, you feel that you are in the marketplace, you're in a sphere of influence, and you know that you're called to be here, I want to ask you now to stand up. Yeah, let's give it up for these individuals. 
I just want to say to you guys that you are not second-rate Christians. You're not less holy than a missionary. Your work matters. And so what I want to do for the rest of us is to extend hands to these individuals and I'm going to pray a prayer of commissioning over you. For you who feel called into the marketplaces, into the homes, into this city. I pray, compelled by Christ, that you would be deployed now to serve your city to which God has sent you. So long as God has you here, may your work be an act of worship. May you love the people in your midst and may you always stop for the one. May God give you the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people unto himself. May God grant you creative problem-solving capabilities. May you lead in your field and be innovative for the glory of God and the flourishing of our communities. May your businesses be a blessing for the owners, for the managers, for the employees, for the patrons, and all who they serve. May your witness be consistent and true, always pointing people back to Christ. May God's kingdom come and may his will be done in your place of ministry as it is in heaven. For Christ and his kingdom, we deploy you now to love and to serve. Welcome to the ministry. Won't we all stand and worship together?